Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with me your host Agassino Zynga and this is episode number 466 that's 466 how you doing how you feeling great good to know if it's your first time checking out the show via youtube you know what to do smash that like button hit subscribe leave me a comment down below and of course if you listen to the podcast app a five star review any share will help to sh- get the show along the way you know how it is you know how it is and of course support via patreon is always more than welcome at patreon.com for us a g o s t i n h o that's patreon.com for us agostino to get bonus content on there i'm going to be doing a review of time that i recently watched on bbc i play as well as some other stuff on there so if you want to check out some of that stuff then please log on to patreon.com for us agostino register for little as one dollar per month to get access to all my bonus content only available on patreon don't delay get involved on there today oh how's it going hope you're good wherever you may be as you can tell watching the youtube video i am dripping sweating from the top of my head to the soles of my feet i try and keep still i try and not to move too much but you know unfortunately i have one of those um i have a physiology that doesn't really permit me to stay cool in hot summer months especially when i'm in you know a household such as mine which is water wall carpet water wall installation which is great for the winter it means you don't have to put the heating on you can conserve energy pretty well but as soon as the heat comes around oh baby oh baby i'm dripping and i'm not talking about dripping in a good way i'm not talking about dripping in the r&b way i'm not talking about dripping in the you know ecstasy way i'm talking about dripping in the most unsexy unflattering way possible and it's not fun it's not fun but you know what can we do to kind of combat it i've decided to um dabble in the old san pellegrino i've got a bit it's a bit chilled now but obviously it's a bit you know it's kind of coming close to room temperature at the moment which is not the greatest thing, but I'm also trying to get myself used to the, you know, daily taste of drinking sparkling water because I'm pretty certain, especially during the first couple of raves and events that I tend to go to, hopefully they happen because, you know, there's been so many things occurring in the UK with the opening dates and stuff. And we're no one's really sure as to what's actually going to go on. And if we're able going to, if we're actually going to be able to go out and party as, you know, we all kind of hoped we would be, but if we are, then the plan is to, you know, be stocking up on San Pellegrinos for the first two or three. I plan to go completely sober and just really, you know, absorb and soak in the atmosphere of where I'm at, especially the first couple, at least maybe the first one, but at least at least one or two. Or let's say one or three. Let's do that range. That's what I want to do just to kind of get myself acclimatized. So the first thing that needs to be done is obviously get the hydration and the annoying thing if you've been to i'm sure if you've been if you live in a metropolitan city it doesn't matter a metropolitan city any place that you live at where you've had some sort of like outdoor festival or a rave event right usually the alcohol is probably quite crap especially in the uk right the they don't mix you know they give you like a a, a, a a pinky finger worth of alcohol in your mix of drinks so you're always overpaying that regard the beer that you drink is usually warm and overpriced and then any kind of soft drink that isn't an alcoholic beverage is just an afterthought right there's usually a really crappy brand of water that they're trying to save money on the juices aren't that great and nothing's chilled so if you are trying to have a sober one you're really putting yourself at a disadvantage because there's legitimately nothing that you can drink in these places so i'm constantly i'm actually you know honestly thinking about maybe i should get one of those um yeti flasks you know those yeti things that you can put ice in supposedly it keeps stuff cold for like ages right so maybe i could just chuck in a couple of ice cubes into one of those massive flasks and just carry that around with me and just keep topping up all my water and stuff in there but you know a lot of these places don't allow people to take any containers or stuff inside the place from outdoors so that might make it a bit difficult so let's see what i'm going but i'm definitely going to do something along that kind of line so I need to get myself used to drinking these San Pellegrinos on a daily basis. Now, I mean, this bubbly, bubbly water. I wonder who decided bubbly water was a good idea. Sparkling water. Do you think it was? Because I'm sure a lot of people who are trying to be sober or in general, I'd, I'd imagine so, or people that are trying to wane themselves off of drinking like soft drinks are probably, you know, substitute it with sparkling water. But I wonder where it actually stemmed from this idea of having water that was more bubbly. I wonder if it was kind of a 
as with most things, it was mostly a thing to like separate the haves and the have nots, I bet you, maybe, right? It was something that was kind of, um, you know, the haves wanted to have um, the option to drink water that differentiate, they differentiate themselves from the lower classes. So they decided to, you know, um, to manufacture theirs with bubbles and then give the commoners the still one because that's what comes out straight from the mountains, I'd assume. Who knows, but happy I've got it here. Happy I've got it here. So, jump pack show to get into today. Loads of stuff to talk about. Loads and loads and loads. So, grab yourself a drink wherever you need, and let's just dive on deep. So, first things first, in terms of updates and what's going on here in the UK, we've got vaccinations are going to be extended for people over the age of twenty five, which is amazing. I've seen pictures of loads of young kids queuing up outside of vaccination stations, eager to get jabs and stuff. And it's funny because I would have. Not to say I'm, dis no, I'm disappointed, but I'm surprised at how quick, I'm surprised at the amount of, um, what's that word called? Is it uptake, uh, adoption, whatever that word is called, right? I I'm surprised at the amount of people that just kind of, without blinking, just to decide, you know what, fuck it, I'm going to get jabbed up. I would have thought there would be a little bit more resistance, a little bit more pushback, people kind of having, you know, uh, philosophical reasons why they're not going to get vaccinated, maybe moral reasons, maybe scientific reasons, whatever, or just deciding, hey, I just don't want to do it. But the fact that everyone's kind of decided that, you know what, I just want to return back to quote unquote normality. So if this is the way forward, I'm just going to do it really does speak to how much this entire virus and this entire lockdown situation is. I feel like it's grounded us all down like we're all kind of slow like, like how i'm melting now we're all slowly but surely being ground down to dust and we just want to get this thing over with so we don't care what it takes if it requires having to you know take a vaccine if it requires having to stand outside in the heat and wait for your turn to get jabbed up you're gonna do it you're just gonna do it just to make it quickly as just make it as quick as possible um for stuff to reopen but again like i said personally or prior unfortunately for some reason this you know this uptaking people getting vaccinated and you know numbers dropping considerably there is still some weird spike happening for some reason i would assume it has to do with just people being outdoors i just think it's one of those things where we just kind of have to decide like you know which is a bit bleak but the government have to decide the amount of numbers that they're okay with in terms of you know cases and deaths for the life to return to normal it just doesn't seem logical or sensible or rational to expect us to go back to a world where people are just not going to be dying or not going to be getting covid it's just going to happen i guess it's just one of those things it's a novel coronavirus it's just there's always going to be cases and unfortunately deaths and families being torn apart by it but you know the larger case at the moment now is that we have a population of people that have been you know locked indoors or prevented from living their best life for the best part of what 15 plus months is now going right 16 is approaching by the time we hit august it's going to be two years already we've been living with some sort of restriction so it feels like for as much progress as we're making it feels like we're not making any progress you know what i mean that's a okay, it kind of feels like it's kind of going uh, it's like two steps forward a couple steps back but let's um, read this news. It says your vaccination is extended for people over 25 in England. It says people aged from 25 to 29 in England will be able to book their coronavirus vaccine from Tuesday morning. Obviously, it's passed. Health Secretary Matt Hancock announced the extension of the country's COVID-19 vaccination program in a statement to the MPs in the comments. He also said that it was still too early to say whether the steps um, for of the England roadmap out of lockdown will go ahead on June 21st. From this week, we will start offering vaccinations to people under 30 bring us ever closer to the goal of offering a vaccine to all adults in the uk by the end of next month so it feels like they're just pushing to get the vaccinations done or offer it up so that they can say they've met their quota they've kind of delivered on their promises but they're not actually trying to get the country back up to normal back up to speed it feels like it's just one of those sort of like oh let's just protect our backs and make sure we don't have any embarrassing situations where people are reading out some of our past quotes but then actions that we've done now haven't really been marrying up to it it doesn't know it just feels a little bit conniving you know what i mean it kind of feels a little bit conniving it continues says from tomorrow morning we'll open vaccinations to people aged 25 to 29 over the remainder of this week the nhs will send texts to people in these age groups in the gps and will be inviting people on their on this on their list to come forward 
So see, the announcement means that around 3 million more people will be uh, becoming eligible for vaccine, a total of 40 million 460 uh, people in the UK so far have received their first jab, while 27 million second jabs have been administered. Um, the all adults have already been called forward to get the vaccine in Northern Ireland and most of Wales. So some good news there, right? Some good news. But then to kind of dampen the mood a little bit, there's this news courtesy of the times which is annoying to say the least which says this june 21st lockdown lifting set to be delayed by a fortnight which is you know and you know you you got the two horsemen of the apocalypse right here right in uh sir patrick valance and chris Whitty, right in center of the article so it says the following Britain's roadmap for easing lockdowns could be delayed by a fortnight with cabinet ministers increasingly pessimistic about the downbeat briefing from Chris Whitty and Sir Patrick Valance. The delay will enable all over 50s to be fully vaccinated and leave the sufficient time for jabs to take effect before restrictions are lifted. Whitty, the chief uh, medical officer of England, Valance, the chief scientific advisor, yesterday gave a briefing to ministers on the latest data that was described as fairly grim. <laughs> Oh, it never ends. They have, they emphasize concerns about the rate of transmissions of the new strains of coronavirus, such as the Indian variant, which is again, there's going to be so many variants that are just going to keep on popping up. What are we going to do? We're going to keep ourselves in. Like, I just don't understand. This makes sense. We're just meant to stay indoors until all variants are eradicated. That's near, near, nigh on impossible, I would imagine, for that to happen or for that scenario even to come to fruition. Huh? Continues here. It says, such as the Indian variant that the vaccine did not provide 100% protection for, millions of Britons remain unvaccinated. Um, one cabinet source said that they expected to be a delay between two weeks and a month, but suggested that the political fallout was likely to be limited as long as a full reopening took place before the start of school summer holidays late next month. Bruv, I could give a fuck about school summer holiday. Let me free. Let me have freedom. Another said that the delay made more sense than the partial lifting of a lockdown restrictions to avoid any confusion in messaging. Okay, so I'm assuming one option would be again this is all rumors i guess one option could be instead of telling everybody hey go out and do what you want it could be a one option where you permit some things within you know reason and then the rest later on but then some people are saying the messaging will be mixed up so you're better off just saying delay it two weeks or just open things up there is no middle ground which is makes complete sense but i just don't get what difference really two weeks or a month is going to make overall to the landscape that we're in at now at the moment if there is really again i'm dubious about these concerns with these other variants i still think variants are you know gonna always unfortunately pop up there was a if i'm not mistaken wasn't there like a thailand variant or something from southeast asia right another variant that popped up out of the blue so there's always going to be some sort of variant that's going to pop up I'm not sure how they kind of you know manifest and how they come to be that's obviously way above my intellect, uh, intellectual capacity, but I would imagine going forward that two weeks um, delay or a month delay doesn't necessarily make that much change when it comes to um, people, you know, unfortunately contracting Corona. It does, doesn't make any sense because there's no guarantee that the uptake in people getting vaccinated is going to drastically improve within the four weeks. If they're worried about people going out right now, that means that so far maybe the vaccination uptake is kind of, plateaued which is probably why they may have opened it up to more age groups i don't know but it doesn't feel like it really makes any sense to be completely honest this just feels like they're trying to make sure that we're above like you know 98 percent compliance or safety before reopening things but it just doesn't feel like that's sensible it feels like we're always going to be within some level of risk we've kind of got to this great point now at the moment despite how poorly we started with our response to COVID, like we should take this victory and try to make the best of it. Unfortunately, there's going to be some, again, people who won't be as fortunate going forward, but this is just one of those cold, hard realities you have to face as a government, isn't it? You're going to have to make a decision because they're going to have to make it one way or the other. What number is enough? What number will they are they willing to accept in terms of cases and deaths for us to get back to normal? That has to just be a conversation, especially now with the variants, especially now with, you know, basically, you know, every adult being offered a, a vaccination in some way, shape or form. It just doesn't make any sense. People are really not going to have it. I think it's going to cause a lot of turmoil. And again, it's another conniving thing because it feels like purposely the Tory government have been quite clever. They've got another good praise and all the good sort of PR and feedback from the June 21st thing. And now as we get closer to it, they're now telling us that, hey, that probably won't happen. 
And then by that time, everyone's just thankful that we've got some level of freedom, right? So again, we're in this weird position where we're like, you know, um, clapping and saying thank you to the government for allowing us to go to dinner and go to pubs and stuff, which is insane. But hey, we're here we are. And then if they delay it by two weeks, people are going to be like, you know what? It's okay. We get it. Because we've just been, it feels like people have just been ground down. People have lost the will to fight and to really make a noise. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, you know, condoning people to start going outside and doing like those anti vax wild ads and start protesting in the side of flipping Asda or anything. But there needs to be some level of pushback from the public in some way, shape, or form. Like, come on. Like, this is enough. Like, do you know what I mean? With vaccination numbers are pretty high. People are getting jabbed up in the front center. Stuff is reopening. People are looking, you know, some industries, especially hospitality, especially within my space, within the clubbing scene, are gearing up for this big monumentous occasion to reopen their doors, get some money in the tail and kind of, you know, get a smile back on people's faces. And now they're all in, stuck in limbo, hoping that next Monday we have some good news. It's just not on really, man. It continues. It said the Prime Minister spokesman... Um, said that while that there was nothing in the data to suggest that the restrictions could not be eased on June 21st, the government would look closely at the case numbers and hospitalizations. Johnson is expected to make a formal announcement on Monday when government social distancing review will be published. On June 21st, the government hopes to end all social distancing, meaning that venues such as pubs, restaurants uh, would no longer require to enforce a one metre plus rule. The rule of six indoor gatherings will be lifted and nightclubs will be allowed to return. The 30 person limit on events including weddings will be lifted and the rules of wearing face coverings and guidance on working from home so there's a lot riding on that monday's announcement a really a lot riding and i don't know to be honest would am i surprised that there's been some sort of you know bump along the road probably not i was still one of those people that said if you had booked a holiday or whatever, something in the beginning of lockdown and, you know, you needed to go away somewhere. I was one of those people that said, you know what, just take advantage of whatever freedom you're given in this, you know, in the moment and just make the most of it. Don't kind of like plan too far ahead in the future with like holidays in September, October, all this kind of thing, because you don't know where the world is going to be. And things can just change, you know, on a constant, basically two week basis and all the time. So with that in mind, I'm not surprised that there has been some kind of bump in the road. It's just, again, just a bummer more so. I forget myself as being a customer of these places, but I can just imagine if you're an operator, right? You're an owner of a club and a restaurant or a bar, or whatever, a theater, and you're just about, you know, managed to hang on until now. And you're kind of seeing the light in the tunnel and you're hoping that you can just hang on a couple more weeks before you can reopen your doors and get things back started again, right? And have put the destiny back in your own hands and be able to kind of pay your bills through your own sweat of your own brow instead of, you know, sitting around waiting for furloughs and stuff, whatever, right? And that's been a position where suddenly that could all be just pulled away from you. And you have no real say in it. You have, you know, no real way to, con you know, to, com to kind of argue against it no real way to fight against it nothing you just have to kind of sit and wait for the government to tell you when and when you're allowed to you know be able to make a living support your family support your community provide a place for your employees to work you know it's just a wild situation to be in it really really is wild um, again it's only rumors now hopefully things can change because like i said i've had enough of all this nonsense but it's not looking optimistic man it's not looking optimistic um let's move on from that what else are we gonna talk about here? Oh, this is interesting. This is um your da, 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 da. yeah, this is interesting. This is courtesy of BBC. It says your story is out of work email. So supposedly in France, which makes complete sense, it's illegal to email people outside of work hours, right? <laughs> which obviously you don't get here in the UK because you know people. If there's ever a country that loves a bit of a workaholic culture especially in the workplaces it's definitely here in the uk it's kind of changed over time i think the introductions of startups has kind of maybe eased some of the more toxic traits that can exist within the uk workforce um but in general there is a lot of kind of like burning the candles at both ends sort of culture in the uk and in general though to be completely honest about it it does get rewarded like i've not really I've not really heard of many stories within my own social group of people who have worked extra hard, done the long hours, come in early, left late and not been rewarded 
in terms of monetary position, whatever it may be, um, you know, acknowledgement from their manager. It very rarely happens. If it does, usually the second place you go to, they usually sort you out. Do you know what I mean? So that's a good thing about it. Like if you can show and prove that you're good at what you do, you usually get snapped up pretty quickly here on the job market in the UK, especially if your role is something that people actually want and it's not some kind of wanky thing that I do, like social media managing, whatever, right? No one really cares about that sort of stuff. But if you've got an actual real job that kind of means something, think and is vital to the success of a company then you're going to be a-okay in terms of finding a place where people actually appreciate what you do so this is courtesy of the bbc and it says the following it says calls for a ban on out of hours work emails have generated a lot of debate among our readers um the the right to disconnect has been a law for four years in france where companies are asked to set agreed specific hours for the teleworkers right which is pretty impressive um alan also brought in a code of practice last month under which employers should add um footers and pop-up messages to remind their employees that there is no requirement to reply to emails out of hours the prospect uh, trade union whose members include managers civil servants and engineers wants the uk government to set out a similar uh, protection for its employment bill expected to be published later this year many readers agreed with the proposal while others felt that it would not be practical or desirable here's a section of our views so, so the following bob said who works for a company which advises businesses on electronic communication says it's a common problem which is easily solved we all know how to send lots of copies but we don't know how to not to send it's a common problem because people don't necessarily think about what the whole effect of their message is going to be for the recipient he says that people send messages on sunday evening to finish their to-do list but the person who gets it thinks dear lord am i supposed to be answering emails on sunday evening as well as easy way out of it is for organizations to agree on common standards he says and one of the most useful standards is what is expected response time for emails i haven't met that sometimes but unfortunately that kind of culture does exist and it usually comes from the top it's usually like a top-down thing um if like your managers or your superiors or people above you in any way shape or form are kind of conducting or behaving in this sort of way where they're emailing each other on a sunday or get you know putting up sending out emails on, on a friday evening at like 10 p.m then it's going to foster an atmosphere where everybody feels like they have to kind of do that and they have to respond in some way shape or form i've never really been somebody that gets you know panicked when i see like an email especially when i've got like a list of things i need to do like a to-do list i'm quite systematic in that way i have my kind of tasks i need to do there might be some wiggle room in terms of when i have to do them but overall what as soon as i get the, the kind of the kind of um skeleton or the framework of my job or my you know um occupation done then all the other stuff can kind of you know get filled in here and there so i don't really get shook too much when i have like an email pop up i know or a chat with somebody but i know a lot of people do feel like that when they have like when they hear the ping of the email or the ping of a direct messaging app or something it can sometimes kind of take them completely off course and make them lose their concentration get them flustered and just kind of cause a lot of undesirable stress so that's also something people need to look out for a lot as well which you mentioned and it's like it's not about you just sending it it's all well and good if you want to be the workaholic because i think you know i don't think it should be outlawed if you want to send an email after you know at 9 p.m on a sunday you can reach your world within your rights to do so but it's just the idea that you're expecting that person who is receiving it to also reply at that same time that's where it just becomes a little bit unfair in that regard and it's never always a, and it's always a two-way street it feels like it feels like the person sending it is sending it because they want to work that late and it's also they feel as if they are entitled to an answer from the person that they're, that they're sending it to which is a bit loopy continues it says um rachel haber habergam is that it? haber haberg habergam Habergham, yeah, sorry, pronounce her name. Rachel Habergham works in the public sector and thinks banning emails outside the office hours would set us back years. She says people need to be able to email at a time that works best for them. The key is to everyone respecting that. Not everyone should feel as though that they have to reply. This could be done in many ways, including simple messages on email signatures. Banning out office emails will just further disadvantage people who are carers, parents, or disabled. 100% agree with that. A woman who works in the civil service in London told us organizations has pretty clear expectations around number of hours work, but flexibility to work when you like. I often leave work early, then pick up later in the evening, she says, adding that she has an email signature which shows that she does not expect a response outside of normal working hours. 
as long as you can set an expiration for your team you no know, expectation for your team that they don't need to respond then i think it's okay she said in the previous private sector jobs they don't expect you to be super responsive so it's all about the culture of a company for sure and that's what it is like i've again i've worked in places where people have you know been sending emails like you know on friday nights and stuff saturday nights it's just it's legitimately insane especially when they cc your entire team so you're getting pings throughout the entire weekend but usually it's people that are operating you know on the higher kind of echelons of said company and again they've in, they've entered in they've entered into this kind of like tacit sort of you know employment battle which they're not really aware of that they kind of conduct them that kind of partaking in and it doesn't usually affect the underlings but it can negatively affect you um but again if it doesn't marry up with how you view work to be then i think it's within your remit to maybe raise it with your managers obviously bring you up and say hey this is something i'm not really cool with and if it doesn't get addressed just leave i'm not really a fan as well again of staying in places where you're being made to do things that you just just don't is necessarily want to do or feel like things that kind of jive with how you think or like the workplace culture to be and if it isn't like that then you, you're better off taking a hit and being unemployed for a couple of months and finding something that actually does fit than trying to make something that doesn't fit fit it just doesn't work in that regard i think going forward um one more rachel andrews is retired but used to work in banking and he says that there are serious compromises that would be needed he says he says he worked a 35 hour week that would not uh, that would often deal with emails after returning home between 80 and 100 daily god almighty he thinks this is quite likely to contribute to a stroke suffered five years ago what the fuck I estimated I was paid for approximately 75% of the extra hours I worked. Whilst no one is indispensable, there is peer pressure, management, and board pressure to get the job done. And I'm sad to admit it at times, I felt that at any cost. That is wild. Imagine having a stroke from all the stress that's been caught, that's been brought upon you from having to answer to, you know, in emails daily on a constant basis, 24 hours. Like, that is just, that's when you know a job's probably not worth it when it's causing you to have a stroke it really really isn't worth it there's no job in the world that should be eliciting that kind of you know physiological response from you it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever but you know maybe everyone's different and maybe you know the demands and your career aspirations because that's a thing too like if you're really driven and you want to make something of yourself and this is the one chance you've been given i understand sometimes some people be like you know what i'm, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to make this happen i don't care if i have to work you know 70 million hours per week i have to answer emails on the weekend i'm gonna make this a big thing so I, I get it i get it so this is courtesy of the verge this is news courtesy of the verge pretty cool news actually this is up close and personal with the ford f-150 lightning electric pickup truck so i think what was it was it last year yeah last year tesla announced a cyber truck that's due to come out next year 2022 i think it was going to start production this year but they're probably going to start production next year but some there's been some delays obviously due to covid and due to i don't think they were able to set up the or is it the giga berlin I think so. I think it's a manufacturing warehouse in Berlin that's going to make the Cybertruck. But either way, there's been delays, there's been pushed back. But because of the Cybertruck, I found out a lot of stuff about the Ford F-150 and how it's the most, you know, um, what it's the most uh, well-sold car. But yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, is that the right term? I think it's the right term. In the US, I think um, from the time of writing, it's close to a million um, F-150s were sold last year. And if you're just listening to the podcast on F-150, it's basically a pickup truck a very popular Ford model that's, you know, you still always see them featured in loads of American TV shows and whatever it may be. And I guess people just use them as an, I guess it's the American version of like a white van, it feels like, because it's quite multi-purpose. It's got the flatbed at the back that can, that can, that can be covered. Um, usually most of them are kind of six-seater, so you can, you know, have a lot of people jumping in them and whatever it may be, towing capability, all that good stuff. So it's a basically a US version of a, of a white van man without being, you know, um, a van it's essentially and it feels like obviously with tesla introducing the cyber truck ford F felt a bit of pressure um which is surprising because it feels like some of the bigger car manufacturers you know electric cars are a bit of an afterthought um but they definitely saw that you know especially with the burgeoning market and with cyber truck being you know, as amazing as it is they wanted to capitalize on that what would you call it brand loyalty that they already have with people that love the f-150 and just make a lightning version of it and they've done it so um they've made an electric version of f-150 and it looks pretty 
um, similar to the regular F one fifty. They've kind of changed the grill. It's got this kind of plasticky um, jacket thing at the front with no air vents because obviously there's no um, engine there. And then the lights have been changed to the front, so it's kind of like this bar that goes around it. That's pretty cool. There's some branding I think around it too. Obviously out here that says lightning. There's I think a lightning thing at the back of the pickup truck next to the flags. A little lightning bolt some tweaks here and there mostly interior but apart from that it looks like a pretty standard f-150 but it's entirely electric so that's pretty cool isn't it so this is courtesy of the verge it says at first glance a giant pickup truck parked in the middle of the pedestrian path along the hudson river greenway was indistinguishable in this quinges, how do you say that in this distinguishable that's right um from other service vehicles after all it was just another f-150 the most popular pickup truck and the most popular vehicle in the u.s but a closer look would reveal some key differences the full length um the full width sorry light bar in the front and the rear vehicle the giant front trunk or frank and the lightning badge on the rear corner of the trunk it was less than a week since the big debut at deb at Deborn and the all-new F-150 Lightning, the automaker's first electric pickup truck, was making a quick appearance at the Manhattan in Manhattan, sorry, before heading back home. Um one well, of the first thing you'll notice about the F-150 Lightning is how big it is. It's not surprising given how huge trucks are in the US have been um, getting over the several decades. But while the F-150 Lightning is roughly the same size as a fossil fuel um, equivalent, it weighs 6,500 pounds or more than 35% more than a gas version. So there's a lot of weight on there, it? And again, it's probably going to be... Um, What's the thing called low center of gravity of course because of all the batteries being right at the bottom of the chassis itself um that's in large part thanks to the 1800 pound battery resting immovably in the floor of the trunk so it's a huge beast it's just interesting that um pickup trucks aren't that popular in the uk it makes sense anyway because most of them are pretty big they're not exactly the best things to drive on you know uk streets you probably can't find a lot of parking um, that's going to make it you know manageable for somebody especially if you're a handyman or craft whatever you work with your hands outdoors and stuff it's just not really functional to be able to drive a car that you can't park in most places and that you have to kind of walk far distances to get to where you're going to actually do your work so that doesn't make any sense but they are quite functional in it more than quite functional they're very very functional it says yeah um depending on the configuration that battery will power the F-150 Lightning for 230 to 300 miles of range in a single charge. It also helped to load um, loads of truck stuff like the fueling and towing and off-roading. The electric version of the F-150 does not lack its truckness. It has lots of quirks and features that will keep you fans from among that will keep that will find its fans among the millions of current F-150 owners, such as the extra step that extends out at the back of the tailgate to help with climbing onto the bed, or the ridiculous number of power outlets uh, that can be found all over the truck the bed also serves as a scale that can help factor in the weight of whatever cargo is being carried to see how it would adversely affect the truck's overall range but what an amazing thing in it like look at the unintended consequences of tesla announcing the cyber truck right now an entire sector of automakers has decided you know what we need to kind of compete we need to make sure that we're kind of throwing our hat in a ring and one of the kind of again biggest car manufacturers and one of the popular um ranges of pickup trucks decided to directly answer that by making their own and now we have a great you know bit of competition for the customer and ultimately this is the best thing because the customer always wins off the back of this because what it means is that tesla and ford are going to be pushing each other in any way shape or form um to provide as much value as they can for their customer and again um, we're going to be in a far better future because ultimately we're going to move away from fossil fuels and into some more sustainable things like electric powered cars and there's nothing better than seeing people that actually work day to day and you know have to you know manage and whatever it may be being able to use these cars and also be somewhat environmentally friendly that's flipping amazing to see to be completely honest there's a, some pictures here of the frunk the front storage compartment obviously some pictures here on the side it looks really nice to be honest i would love to drive one of those in the uk but again like i said the uk streets are not probably functional for a massive pickup truck such as these but i'm sure there are a couple of youtubers out there that have um 
that kind of you know have a love for the americana side of things that decided to get a pickup truck and drive them in the uk streets is probably not the smartest thing to do especially if you live in a very densely populated residential area a metropolitan city like i do here in london but you know i guess it, it, it can be a bit fun to have have this hurtling down the street somewhere in the m55 you know what i mean i'd say the m25 overtaking you know randoms would be super sick super quiet you know just hurling down the street but it looks really really cool it looks incredible to be fair so i'm I'm really eager and anticipating to see obviously the next couple of iterations of the f-150 lightning and then of course once the cybertruck comes out i'm also interested to see how people use it day to day i think most people will just end up using it just as a car to flex with i think i don't i don't know maybe i'm 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 being too pessimistic i don't think it's gonna be a lot of kind of you know workers day to day that are going to switch from an f-150 to a cyber truck it doesn't necessarily feel like that's going to be a thing especially with the lightning that's just been introduced i think most people that are going to buy the cyber truck are just going to buy it because it's a it's an interesting looking car or they just like what it looks like do you know what i mean not not really using it for their day-to-day -day, um work whatever it may be but yeah Ford F-150 Lightning, I guess it's going to be out soon. I think when I last saw pre-orders, I was like at a 70,000 mark, which is pretty decent considering all things considered, especially again with the competition that exists out there with the bloody um, Tesla Cybertruck in it. That makes complete sense. What else do we have here? What else do we have here? We have news courtesy of Jound. They are about to launch another collaboration this time with the legendary bootmaker dr martins who i worked for previously a long 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 time ago um great in it they've done collaborations with that van so far the collaborations with new balance reebok in terms of footwear and now um they're heading into kind of the more um refined grown up aspect of sneakerdom and deciding to do a dr martin i expect it's probably going to be the 1460 right um because it feels like everyone's doing their own interpretation of it you've got the rick owens version that just came out recently and a few others prior to that so i'm assuming in-house there is a push for dr martin's to basically um align this 1460 with some of these major brands or whatever it may be um whoever's in charge of doing this is doing a hell of a job some of the collaborations they've been doing have been really far out really interesting um obviously there's been a lot of kind of relationships i feel like with people like you know jeffrey um oh what's his name jeffrey star um lover boy whatever his name is i forgot his name charles jeffrey he has a lot of relationships he feels like with dr martins from the ground up it felt like he did a lot of good stuff with them and when he was kind of putting out his fashion shows and then because i like what they do in that regard so they it feels like they kind of help out people in one sense or maybe there's like a slow build up in a relationship where they kind of you know send you a couple of shoes to put in your collection and over time as a relationship kind of blossoms and you kind of get a better understanding that then provide you or allow you access to more of their resources and then it kind of takes a step up from there <clears throat> and that's just probably what you're seeing <clears throat> with some of the stuff that they're doing now um but this john thing's a first iteration we've seen it again i'm i'm anticipating a 1460 it could be something else um going forward but i don't think it's going to be a new model whatever it's going to be something they kind of built from the ground up it's probably going to be an updated colorway of an existing model but i'll be interested to see how john decides to kind of sprinkle some of his kind of john um aesthetic onto a dr martin because if i'm not mistaken I used to read John quite often when it was, you know, just a blog spot. And I don't really remember seeing a lot of Dot Martins, to be completely honest. It felt like there was a lot of sort of, you know, North American type inspired um, boating and leisure type shoes or tennis shoes for the most part, or just straight up sneakers. But I didn't really see a lot of Dr. Martin boots. Maybe there were some pictures and, you know, whatever, maybe or kind of clips, archive clips of like, you know, um, people from the punk era and the you know vivian westwood types and whatnot wearing a pair in this couple of pictures but i never really saw any sort of love being kind of put out there from justin saunders regarding anything to do with dr martin so it'll be interesting to see if and how he's able to kind of make that silhouette work with your aesthetic because you know the dr martin's isn't is a very unforgiving shoe right it's not the most subtle it's not the most um um it's not yeah it's just not it's just not soft you know what i mean it's not kind of soft on the edge soft around the edges it's kind of rough it takes a long time to break them in 
um they're a bit robust right um obviously the, you won't say robust I, I would say john's quite robust even the totes and the jackets and stuff they make right there is a kind of robustness to them but they always feel a little bit more refined a little bit more chic than what you'd imagine the Dr. Martens would be, right? Dr. Martens is, is a bit more aggressive. It's a little bit more in your face. So I'd be interested to see how he's able to kind of soften it up and make it work with his stuff. Again, who knows? Maybe I'm reading too much into it and it's just going to be in, you know, an all white 1460 with some off white accents and stuff. But I'm sure he's going to try and make it, you know, a little bit more interesting than that. A little bit more interesting than that. What else have we got here? What else do we have here? We have news. Oh, it's another bit of news with trainer them. We have news courtesy of this is courtesy of Hype Beast. We have this little picture um, featured here. This is, I think, this is from um, yeah. This is from the guy called uh, what's his name, Teddy Santis, who's the um, now the newly appointed creative director of New Balance in the US, who is also the founder of the brand called Amelie. Is it Amelie Dior? Have you have you pronounced that name? How do you pronounce it? How do you pronounce it? Emily, Emily on door right yeah and he decided to leak an image of an updated um, 990 version 6 now I'm not too sure if this is something Teddy DeSantis actually or Teddy Santis sorry made himself from the ground up as one of his first four projects as a creative director of New Balance USA or if it's something that was already in the pipeline and he just kind of came along and maybe you know okayed but regardless of who is responsible I like it I like the paneling I like the midsole um, I like some of the little assets here on the front. I love the little details. I love the color blocking. I think it's worked really, really, really well. Um, and I can't wait to see what it look like on foot. But if anything, if, if this side profile is giving me anything, it's definitely giving me a good bit of tooling here. You know, nice flat, no, no unnecessarily banana foot bend. The toe box is nice and flat here as well. It just doesn't look like it's going to be, you know, smushing or moving around all over the place. It just looks really well done. And again, I just like this well the, the addition of the, these like classic white flat laces. None that nonsensely, nonsense tubular stuff. Hopefully the tongue is just a normal tongue and not one of those tongues that sort of like elasticates itself to the size of the walls of the shoes. Just, you know, those tiny things that just gets you annoyed. So overall, it looks pretty, pretty banging no idea on the day i want the due to come out again not too sure if it's a collab or not going forward but it'll be cool to see um i wonder if some people who've done that new balance collaborations are a little bit annoyed about this teddy santis hiring at new balance usa i wonder if they feel like it's like a conflict of interest like he's going to be you know obviously he's kind of got a lot of um, credit in the bank with some of these new balance collaborations that have been widely successful but you would feel a little bit away that he might be able to get access and obviously he will have access to and maybe give him the opportunity to do like loads of really cool interesting stuff before everyone else does just because he's in house do you know what I mean and obviously he's got um a name recognition clout all that good stuff i wonder if people are some brand owners are a little bit annoyed by it peeved off i wonder i would guess it's, it shouldn't be an issue because i think as a brand owner he probably recognizes the pains and the pressures that are you know on people when they get put in this little position so he's probably going to try and give you know pay it back as much as he can with people coming up and stuff but for sure he's going to have the keys to the vault and to the archive and be able to draw and pull from loads of stuff that most people probably won't have the opportunity to do so so you know unique opportunity unique chance to kind of redefine or kind of you know uh steer the new balance usa ship in a whole different new direction you know be able to kind of add his sort of notch onto the creative timeline of what they're doing over there so it's again it's a sick opportunity again he probably deserves it more than anyone a million dollar like you know season in season now regardless of how expensive it most of the items are and the, you know retail prices are you know crazy they remind me of like early fear of god days you right? where they just used to just you know this is a jumper and it's 600 quid like it of like it or jog on do you know what i mean the, or like early vision do you know what i mean if you want it you pay like there is no discount there is no nothing you know even cost is still in the triple digits but people seem to like it again i think look box wise and the, the kind of attention to detail and stuff is just insane so if anyone deserves to give an opportunity to you know be able to have un unfettered access to the vaults it's teddy santis at amelie and Dior. so again new balance and um 9990 version 6 no idea when the date of it's due to come out but you know when it does come out you'll probably know about it before i do 
you'll probably know about it before I do. What else we have here? We have our collaboration courtesy of Supreme with Emilio Bucci. That's due to come out, I'm assuming, on Thursday. That's pretty good. Maybe the best collab or bits of crap. Yeah, probably maybe the best collab I've done in a while. It's really nice. It says here, Emilio Pucci was born in 1914 to Florence oldest noble families his fashion career began in unexpectedly in 1947 when he created the streamlined ski outfit photographed on the slopes of switzerland for harper's bazaar in 1950 he opened his first shop in capri uh, la cazon del mal and dedicated resort to clothing and dedicated to dedicated to his clo resort clothing and he embraced with a unique sense of colour, the American idea of new luxury sportswear. Over the following decade, Emilio Pucci established a global brand renowned for its joyful and modern approach to women's wear. Experimenting with fluid shapes and comfortable fabrics, Emilio Pucci designed easy yet elegant pieces for the international jet set. He developed swirling kaleidoscope prints that would become his signature. You love all this sort of text, right? And then you love also seeing this image side by side. And that's some of the genius stuff that Supreme is able to always do. It kind of, all that stuff doesn't really correlate at all with this image that you're seeing here on the left in it but they've been able to do it in such a great way so let's just go over the pictures and sack off some of the copy because the pictures themselves tell their own story but the items themselves are great great track suits great pants great polo tops like it's all just really really well done cardigan type looking things what do you call it? cardigan capes? I don't know. It's not a cape, in it? What is it? Um, again, great track suits with the patterns all over. They, they, these are gonna fly out. There's even a matching camp cat that goes with it too. There's that button-up shirt. Yep. Long sleeve shirt. Like these are gonna be so popular. They're gonna be all over the place. If if festival season was on this year, you would have seen these at loads of, um, especially UK festivals. People wearing these with you know jean shorts and shit and dusty pair of vans or dusty pair of air force ones all white as per usual but these look great everything about it looks really nice so it's due to come around thursday um check it out if you're that were inspired that that football jersey inspired thing is just flames so yeah check it out if you're that way inclined should be coming on thursday i'm sure most people won't be able to get what they want from it anyway so it won't really matter if it does come out on thursday regardless but yeah that football jersey that they did is just great in it that's probably going to be the standout piece for sure that's going to fly out out of the doors there's even a box logo oh my god yeah it's going to be it's going to be a hot summer for the bots man them worldwide it's going to be a hot summer so definitely keep an eye out if you're that way inspired. Oh, it's a smoking jacket. Actually, it's not a cape. It's lovely, isn't it? A smoking jacket for those that don't smoke or those that, you know, those Instagram kids that pretend they're smoking cigarettes are so just like sucking and puffing it out two seconds later. Imagine posing and waiting to look cool with cigarettes. Like, no, it could never be me. Could never be me. But yeah, check it out if you're that way inclined. It should be available within the next couple of days or so. It does look cool. It does look cool. Sorry about that. It's all these flipping bubbles from this sparkling water. What else is happening here? Let's move on there. Let's do that. We did this. We did that. We did this. We did this. What else? Where is it? Where is it? What am I going to talk about here? Let's move. Oh, it's the one. Yes. Yes, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. What, what time have we got? Have I used up not much more time? Yeah, I have. Bear with me one sec. Let's see this one. Yeah, this is a bit bleak news, but also kind of a. Yeah, yeah, this is bleak news, but also a cautionary tale to most human beings. We, should, we all should be aware of this, but I think sometimes we do sometimes get swept up in the headiness of life and forget what life is actually all about day to day and year to year, wherever it may be. So this is courtesy of BuzzFeed News. It says Kim Kardashian wept about feeling like a failure and a loser as her marriage to Kanye West ended after admitting she'd been unhappy for years. Madness, right? 
So it says the following, um, you may have heard that Keeping Our Connections is coming to an end after 14 years and 20 seasons. Last night, the penultimate episode of the final season aired, and here's what unfolded. If there's one thing about this clan of family members, right, they're definitely going to work out a way to make um, them signing off from reality TV show a box office event. And what better way to box office, what better way to kind of, you know, um, put like a full stop at the end of this chapter um, or the end of this paragraph by divulging and letting people into this very public breakup and dissolving of a happy family unit it's absolutely incredible the lengths that they will kind of you know fall to in order to kind of reveal or and keep people glued it's very it's very much a talent and that crib looks beautiful and it continues so it says yeah this week we finally see the family taking their last on-camera vacay a uh, perfectly relatable 17,000 square foot property overlooking Lake Tahoe but as they arrive it's clear there's something wrong with Kim who announces she wants to go to her room and never come out <laughs> so I shouldn't be laughing during the confessional Chloe reveals that Kim's been struggling privately behind the scene about her relationship bloody hell and it Chloe looks completely like not not to be one of those people but you know because I don't pay attention too much to everything that they do but from the pictures I see of Chloe she generally does look different in every single image and it's not even like a slight difference it's like it's, and again it's mostly her fault because she edits her own pictures on her own social media feed so much that when you do see an image of hers that hasn't been touched with her own finger it just makes you think huh who's this person then it's just so startling isn't it? and it's just an unfortunate state that we're in at the moment or in, you know what most people are in most people some people are in let's revise that where some young ladies feel as if like you know they have to edit themselves to that extent on social media in order to make themselves feel whole or to feel better or just to feel more comfortable whatever the term may be but it's just unfortunate because what ends up happening is that it just creates a cyclical um loop of insults and you know dissing and you know people taking a piss out of you online because every time you upload your own pictures you look one way and someone else takes a picture of you you look another way they then leave comments and it just continues a spiral of like you know um negative emotion feed or whatever yeah, yeah a, i don't know you know what i mean but maybe they maybe they kind of thrive off this as well maybe there is such a thing with some of these people that exist in this sort of realm where any attention is good attention mad as it may be that may be the thing so anyway it continues here it says junior confessional career reveals that kim's been struggling privately behind the scenes about her relationship and said had a huge fight with Kanye right before that they left the trip and is that redirecting her sadness anger and frustration what does that even mean redirecting her sadness anger and frustration how can you redirect your anger and frustration redirecting anger and frustration is pulling out a gun and aiming it outside of a window in las vegas and you know shooting on you know an innocent bystanders that's redirecting your anger going to your room isn't redirecting anger is it i don't anyway um it continues says when they were shown the flashback scene that broke my heart in it we see kim crying to courtney kylie and kendall i honestly can't do this anymore <laughs> look at the fit that always that always um that's the kind of uh phase that you have when some one of your close friends is going through something very really traumatic but you don't know how to help right like kind of got that kind of face like uh what do i do do i put my arm around you do i give you a tissue do i cry also that's usually your best way to go about it if you actually want to help somebody and somebody's going through a tough emotional problem just start crying as well just start just start, think think about something sad and just start crying maybe that's the only way they can actually help them but it's, it's quite a funny scene <laughs> <laughs> the two kind of uh conflicting emotions they're like, going through you know does this mean i can't get any more yeezys and this was great because their family's been torn apart but anyway i shouldn't be laughing let's continue it says yeah i'm still get i'm still in this place i guess it's a kim quote it says i'm still in this place where i've been stuck for years she goes on he goes and moves to a different state every year and i have to get together so i can raise these kids he's an amazing dad and he's done an amazing job that's a bit of a that's a bit of a weird sentence in it really in it somebody that you're meant to be in a relationship with as a partner in crime you know and also as a partner in terms of looking after your family moves to different states every year you have to just kind of gather your things and follow him where he goes but he's also an amazing dad that doesn't make any sense how can you be an amazing dad if you move to a different state every year yeah, you know I mean, he's not in, he's not in the army. Um, you'd imagine so. Maybe he would describe you know running a multi billion dollar fashion empire as equivalent to being in the army. Can't even probably say that. Probably harder than being a navy seal, but still, that's a mad sentence, isn't it? 
continues when Courtney responds that Kanye still will be a great dad even if they divorce <laughs> Kim Sobs he deserves someone that can go and support his every move and go and move to Wyoming I can't do that he should have have a wife that supports his every move and travels with him and I can't yeah again you know th this is again another cautionary tale in it the modern relationships nowadays especially with this kind of idea that you can have it all it's just a fallacy really whether it's men or women doesn't really matter it's a fallacy you can't have it all you have to choose we don't have the ability to have everything we have the ability maybe to choose the things that maybe bring us the most amount of fulfillment most amount of peace give us purpose but in terms of having everything it's just impossible to do so especially for a prolonged period of time especially also if you attach happiness to it if you just want to try and attain as much as you can in this world and try and make your life as best as trying to kind of create the perfect life for yourself in whatever way it may be then yeah fair enough go ahead try and strive towards that but if you're attaching an emotion to it too whether it's kind of contentment whether it's happiness whether it's fulfillment you're definitely going to be disappointed because most i think in my opinion most of our time is spent on this planet trying to bounce back or to respond to or recover from heartbreak disappointment you know like that's what most of your life is and then the short bursts of enjoyment and happiness and whatever it may be called you have along the way are what kind of give you a reason to wake up in the morning right because if our lives were just misery and dread every single day it would make waking up really difficult but there are occasions where you're able to have a good time where you're able to kind of receive a compliment from a stranger that brightens up your day celebrate your birthday you know see a friend do something really amazing or that they've really been working hard to try and do regardless you know what i mean those things kind of help you along the way but this idea that you can have it all it just doesn't work and this is the perfect example of it right kim is somebody that has it all what you would think quote unquote you know monetarily you know fame wise family wise all that good stuff and still you know the everyday struggles that we all have to deal with are still kind of affecting her in some meaningful way which again goes to show that you have to kind of pick and choose your battles in some way shape or form um it continues here it says then the sucker punch comes just says it feels like a failure it feels like a fucking failure that is my third fucking marriage she says i feel like a fucking loser but i can't even think about that i want to be happy it's just impossible though isn't it you have to be like not impossible but it's just one of those things where you just the things one thing you realize as soon the older you get i think it comes with experience i think i was a uh, i was like um um beyond naively optimistic about things and then you to decide to be a little bit more cynical not not too cynical so you rob yourself of having any kind of joy and you know and spontaneity in your life but to the point where you're not kind of in this weird but again maybe this is more so because she's just going to go for a really difficult time emotionally she's just blurting out where it becomes you know um across your mind the first way but this idea that you know you're not going to fail and things are going to be a-okay from the moment you decide to say your vows until the, the kids pop out that you're going to have this kind of seamless kind of problem free marriage is really ridiculous um there's going to be issues you know you're going to encounter them along the way if you can rectify them cool if you can't you go your merry way but it doesn't necessarily define you that failure it doesn't mean that you're a bad person it doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong really to be honest it's just one of those things that just kind of happens in life and you just have to kind of respond to it in jest and keep it moving um but again this this kind of does show it is kind of an illuminating kind of insight into the idea that maybe she did see this marriage as a kind of way to redeem herself a redemption arc right a way of kind of proving the doubters wrong you know i was a hot girl i was doing all this other stuff before i made some mistakes in relationships here and there but i'm deciding this is my next chapter i'm knuckling down i'm a family woman and this was kind of her i wouldn't say um way or whatever it was it was a way to kind of redeem herself and it kind of didn't work out and now maybe this you know this crying face and this despair is more so a reaction to all that pent-up hope and um you know that was kind of attached to this marriage and what can you do man what can you do life is just misery really for the most part there's so much to unpack here that my brain's exploding first is interesting scene to insert okay cool doesn't matter um regardless 
tough times we'll kind of go through them i think for the most part this is another kind of reminder that you know you shouldn't be looking at people too tough and you know scribing couple goals and all that malarkey because you never know what people are going through behind closed doors and again this idea that you can have it all male or female is just ridiculous it really is you should pick and choose the things that you're going to try to have. You should obviously aspire to have as much as you can. But in order to have all of that stuff, you also have to realize you're not going to be happy having your This ascribing an emotion to it is just ridiculous. Because when that happiness doesn't happen, you're going to end up being distraught. You're going to end up being fed up and you're going to you know, chuck yourself off the nearest bridge, which is obviously not the best way to deal with those situations. So, hey, it sounds harsh. It sounds tough. But that is life. And I think that's where we might have to end, actually, because I think I might have covered an hour already, haven't I? I'm pretty sure I did an hour. Yep, I have just under an hour already passed. Again, thanks so much for tuning in to the Excellent Zing Show episode number four. What is it? Six, six, I think, right? Of the show. I'm melting right now, so I'm going to end. If it's your first time checking the show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, a five star review will help the show to go a long, long way. And as per usual, support via Patreon is always more than welcome. You can support the show at patreon.com for slash Agostino to get bonus content such as movie reviews, TV show reviews views i've got one coming up already um the, you know giving my response and reacting to the tv series called time that's available now on the bbc it's an amazing amazing free part little mini series about a guy that unfortunately ends up in prison due to a hit and run and it was really kind of clear and good honest kind of reflection meditation on prison life especially somebody you know in their mid in in their mid 60s or something it feels like the guy is right it's just an incredible an incredible little mini series so i'm definitely going to do a little reaction to that and post that on my patreon so make sure you check that out at patreon.com for just agostino be coming out within the next couple of days but until next time i'll see you soon my friends take care be safe peace